I'll figure this out later, but it is working over here. So it is recording. It's giving me audio. We'll make it work. Can you all see the presentation? We're good. All right. You can hear me. Perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I don't think you guys will be on the recording. I can see. Could I do desktop audio? There we go. There we go. I think you guys are on there now. Anyway. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> Seven minutes, that's not too bad for having issues with the Zoom recording. All in all, we'll take that as a, that's, that's a decent amount of time, so. <laughs> Alrighty, so last time we went over kind of the deep science stuff. I do apologize, I know that's a more intense sciencey lecture. Usually my lectures are more clinically based. And today we're gonna get into some of the tricks that I use to help identify which patients might be more prone to needing a little extra TLC extra medications after, things like that. So first off, like I said, I'm sorry it was so sciencey last time. So let's do something clinical. I had two different things here I wanted to go through. The first one is kind of, you know, what actually is important in endo? We did a prognosis lecture, I think uh, about a year or so ago. Did, did you guys see that one second years? The prognosis lecture? I don't I think sure. So. Yeah, that may have been. Yeah, so we'll we'll do it regardless. That's a that's a one of my favorite ones because I think it really starts you thinking about you know when you're treatment planning on patients. You know, not every patient needs to have white lines in their teeth. Sometimes it's better to get the tooth out. Sometimes it's better to do an implant. So we'll talk about that. But for those of you who don't know, I started my first four years working at a general dentist practice with 10 general dentists and had pretty much 100% recall. So I saw a lot of my own failures very quickly and learned from my lessons. So missing anatomy is really bad. That's probably the number one reason I have to redo root canals is some untreated anatomy. Usually it's the MB2, but it could be a second distal on the lower, things like that. Restorative is really important. That's been shown since, God, I mean, the trope study was what, from the 80s, showing that restorative is way more important than the quality of the endo underneath. So learn how to restore. I know it's difficult in residency. We'll have a second lecture on that or a separate lecture on restorative as well. Feral is way more important than I thought it was in dental school. I know we always talked about it, but the cases that tended to fail most frequently were teeth that had little to no ferrule left. So two millimeters is pretty much guaranteed to be okay. Anything less than that, once you get down to zero, it's a straight up drop. Like the, the if you have no ferrule, your five-year survival rate is almost zero based on all the studies that we see. So it is really important to look at that when you're doing the prognosis. And if a molar is broken down badly enough that it actually needs a post because you're worried about it, you know, holding on, those are usually better as implants. Implants are very predictable in the posterior. It's probably the best place for them. Um, I think the worst place for them is in the anterior. And the good news is we can get away with quite literally murder on teeth <laughs> on the anterior and they last. Um, I have laterals that have had straight up snap offs. And as long as you manage the occlusion, you can actually keep those teeth around for a very, very long time. So what's your takeaway from this right now? Learn how to restore if, as best as possible, and then make sure you find all of the anatomy. And we'll talk about that too. I also went to my discord group and asked them, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of residency? It's one of my favorite questions to ask people when they've been out for about five to 10 years, because we all have different things to say. So this is the summary of them. MB2 is always there. You've, you'll hear that one from me quite a lot. Uh, different techniques to use color at the floor to trough. We'll actually have a separate lecture on that one as well, probably with the MB. Those tend, tend to go together. Um, efficiency and systems design. So that, that's going to be the lecture I'm giving next week in Chicago at the Coolidge Club is going to be on efficiency. And then I'm going to be doing a separate one for all of you on systems design because right now it's a little tough for you to be really efficient because you don't have assistance. However, there are still things you can do to look at how you set up to do a root canal, how you actually do the process. And there's some tricks you can use that you can then apply once you're in private practice and have a assistant. How to restore teeth, we've already been around that. Ultrasonics, kind of what are they? Which, when do we use them? All the different options available. Open up a catalog and you'll see there's just so many different ultrasonics you can play with. An ergonomics one is always fantastic, talking about the microscope. Um, that's one it's a little easier to do in person. That's why I haven't really made a video on that yet, but I'm gonna do my best <laughs> to do that. But it's really tough to like 
show via video, it's easier to actually move people in person and do that one. So maybe I'll come out to SLU and help you with that. Uh, how to navigate complications. So when plan A through Z fails, what do you do after that? And then kind of self-assessment, looking at where are my cases now? What can I do to improve upon them? This was a, I, re I really like the person who, and that was a great one to put in there. Most importantly, I want you all to know very soon, you are not going to worry so much about root canals. There's very few cases that really make my blood pressure go up because they're going to be difficult at this time. Um, calcified teeth really aren't that bad. Thermophil cases aren't, I actually love thermophil. So I know right now you all are super hard and working on, you know, getting better at doing the you know, basic root canals, but I promise one day soon, there's gonna be a bunch of other things that are way more important to you. And this has been, this has been true. Like every time I ask people who have been out for about that, about eight years is when you're going to start to feel like you can pretty much handle most of these things. Imposter syndrome means you'll never actually feel like you can handle it, but I, I promise you will. So, um, before we get on with the lecture, any questions, things I can help with clinically that you've been going on? Are you guys seeing patients yet? First years? Next week. Next week? Oh, that's exciting. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's about when we did too. Um, how do you feel? <laughs> Excited and nervous. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 a good place to be. So cool. And then second years, how are you how are you guys all handling? Have you guys done any surgeries yet? I know it's that's about the time when you'd start to see some pop through. I've got one tomorrow. Tomorrow. Exciting. Okay. What tooth? Number nine. Perfect. That's that's beautiful. Do you got your flap design all ready to go? Yep. Cool. That's that is the most important part of a surgery is setting it up for success. If you get the flap design right. Beautiful. That was I, I, my first case this morning was a surgery on a number twelve, huge infection on there. That'll probably be on YouTube eventually because it's a good size one. So, um, yeah, just you got this. It, it's it's not once you do a few apicos, you kind of realize they're pretty simple. It's flap the tooth, cut it off, prep it, fill it, suture. It's 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 really all you're doing. Um, it's just sometimes there's complications there. So cool. Well, let me know if I can help at all. You all have my phone number, so let me know. All right, recapping from last time, a bunch of our patients are afraid of us. Probably, I would say about 75% of people who walk in for a root canal are going to be anxious and stressed out about the procedure. This is actually a good thing because the bar is then super, super low for us to just hop on over said bar. Louis is here today, actually, so he can, he can show you how he can hop like that. There's a big difference between acute stress and chronic stress. Your main hormone is going to be cortisol that's involved with this. A bunch of our patients who we, you know, the ones you see on the schedule, you're like, oh, this is going to be a fun day. Most of the time, they're chronically inflamed. And there's a reason that they act like that. And there's a reason that they're going to probably have more complications post-operatively as well. And if we're able to figure out which ones that they're, you know, which, which patients are more likely to behave like this, it allows us to identify them, communicate with them, and treat them in a different way to make sure they have that great experience. So... Did anyone have the chance to ask Hatton what 4F stands for? No. Yeah. You, got to, you got to do it after after today. So remember, the it's fat, f uh, female, 40 to 50. That's that's kind of the, the PG version of it. And the reason it's always female, or it's the that's kind of the way that that's been described, there's a reason for that. And we'll get into it later. But think about one of the things is that, you know, the, a lot of the people that you see who are, if you guys been working long enough to know the professions that are going to be the most complicating ones, who, who are the yeah. professions that um, you come in and they're, a, oh, I'm a blank. And you go, okay, you're going to be a problem patient. Did, do we hear nurses? Yeah. Nurses are probably the number one I hear. What else? People in dentistry. People in debt. Oh, yeah, yes. by, we're by far the worst. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know if I agree with this one, but someone recently told me firefighters and police officers. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I have a theory on that one. It's because they have to be so stoic all the time. They're less likely to come in and tell you that they have anxiety until you've already started. So they'll they'll like man up and then kind of freak out halfway through. I've had a few times. The... That's probably, yeah, usually it's those two where like halfway through they kind of have panic attacks and I have to give meds is because they've kind of hidden it from you halfway through. But 
Yes, nurses are probably the number one we hear. That is because they don't sleep, they have an extremely stressful job, and they know just enough about medicine to be dangerous. So that's why I chose a picture of a nurse for this. Now, the question is going to be here, is this determined by... Here, let me get that so you can actually see. Oh, shoot. Sorry, guys. It's moving around. There we go. Uh, is this going to be... Is there some genetic component to stress? Is it nature versus nurture? And I just wanted to point out that AI is very good at doing art, as you can see. I asked it to do uh, just a helix, and it decided to put this weird pink thing in the background. So one of my uh, hobbies is making fun of AI art, so it's very fun. Anyway, <laughs> there are some environmental factors, and this is specifically for being afraid of the dentist, not global information. That would be a lecture of... a thousand hours if I went into that one. If they had a bad experience in the past, that's why if they've had a bad root canal, they're going to be more likely to be afraid to come see you and get another one. Has someone in their family had this? And this is especially true for children, where the parent, one of my worst patients of all time was a little eight year old. He just needed a direct pulp cap on both of his lower molars. And he came in on the full dose of Halcyon could not handle anything. And it turns out both of his parents and grandparents were afraid of the dentist. And anytime he would misbehave, the threat was, well, we're going to take you to the dentist. Awesome. That makes my life a lot easier. Uh, Chris ended up sedating him. It's the first case that we did together under IV. And he maxed out the amount of ketamine in, and I had about five minutes to do the case because the kid was blowing through it that quickly. I ended up having the dental anesthesiologist come in and completely sedate him. And I always warn him, like, hey, we've already tried this. It's going to be hard. They use uh, something called Remy fentanyl, which is like elephant Just fentanyl like pretty much to help keep him down. And generally, the flow rate that this anesthesiologist is what he told me for someone this size would be about 0.1 micrograms. And he was at 0.8. So eight times the amount of fentanyl just to keep this little kid down. So do not underestimate the effect of being told and having it as a threat. It's one of the worst things parents can do is threaten the dentist because it makes the kids extremely afraid. Life stressors, you know, did you just go through a divorce? Did you had to put your dog down? Things like that. That can definitely impact how they're going to handle you needing treatment. Is there a certain, um, you know, have they had issues in the past with this sort of thing? Are they in pain? This is probably the number one thing. If they come in already in pain, all of their receptors are primed to be hitting it as immediately. So this is where sometimes if you have the chance to meet them beforehand, if you can get them out of pain using medications, that can be a big benefit there. Have they been sleeping? Uh, one of my, some of my worst ones where they're like, oh, I didn't sleep at all last night because the pain was so bad. Very difficult then to get them numb and they usually are problem patients during the treatment. What's been done on the tooth in the past? So the last video I posted on YouTube was one about a case that had been accessed. They didn't do anything and leave anything inside there and the tooth just bled like crazy and he felt it as soon as I dropped inside there. So if they've had work on the tooth in the first place, that can cause issues. And then what's their experience with their general dentist? I find that the de general dentists I really enjoy working with have a far lower rate of sending over patients who are problem patients than the general dentist that I don't enjoy working with as much. Was that so diplomatic enough for, <laughs> for everybody? <laughs> yeah. What are you guys saying? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely, yeah. it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a, you know, the, uh, my um, first boss, Jared, had a line that good patients go to good general dentists. It's generally, and that's been very, very true uh, across my years of working. There are some genes associated with opioid receptors, GABA, some of the other receptors that are linked to higher stress levels. Uh, one of those is actually the melanin gene. That's why redheads tend to be more difficult to get numb. That is a true thing. But it's not because of an opioid thing. It's actually because they have higher levels of anxiety. So there's your fun fact of the day. Yes, redheads are more difficult to get numb. I will often ask um, women if they come in and they're redhead, if they are a natural redhead, because they tend to need a little more TLC. And usually they're, they do better on a benzo. Just a you know, fun fact there. 
So just remember when we have this dysregulation, this is the only scary thing you'll see in here. I had to do one more science thing. So <laughs> remember that when you have the adrenal glands kind of firing up, after that, you're going to have that cortisol response about 15 to 30 minutes. And what normally happens is it hits all these receptors, turns everything down, and gets you into that relaxing phase and kind of healing from whatever stress you have. When you are chronically stressed, what then happens is that it's going to then, all this isn't going to work. The off switch doesn't work anymore in these patients. And that's where the problem comes in. Okay. Now, with actual diseases, it's a little tough. Um, obviously, with PTSD, I don't know anyone who's signing up to be in that control group to, you know, you, you, hey, let's give you some trauma. <laughs> um, so it's a little tough to tell based on, you know, the requirements and ethics of it. But there is a little bit of data that there is some heritability to that. Same thing with depression, because it's really far. It's a bunch of different genes that can cause depression. We do see a little bit of aggregation in families. And same thing with anxiety disorder. So a little tough to sell. You know, nature, nurture is the genetics. Are some people more prone to this? Maybe is probably the best answer there. Now, the one thing that really does make a difference is XX versus XY. And what you see is that these patients present in very different ways, and that's because of how the hormones have been interacting on their body. And we'll go into this. But what you see is there is a difference in the HPA, how it is either sensitized or turned down by these two different hormones. What we see is that progesterone and estrogen are going to make it more sensitive, which means it's more likely to become overloaded. Testosterone, on the other hand, is going to drop it down. So it would take more chronic stress for that patient to have the same response as a female. Does that make sense? Okay. What we see here and what this means then is females are going to be more prone to stress-related disorders like depression, anxiety, and autoimmune. Males are going to have more immune dysregulation like metabolic syndrome, um, things like that. The one thing you will see is that because we are not the healthiest country in the world, a lot of times females, when they are overweight, they'll start to have some of the same metabolic syndrome symptoms that men would. And that is because when you are obese and a female, the progesterone levels drop precipitously. And that's the one that helps actually protect against a lot of these things, which we'll get into in just a little bit here. Okay. Now there is a reason for this. And I just want to point out, I know that things have changed as far as gender roles. Uh, this is a, one of the more interesting, um, I read a whole chapter in a evolutionary um, biology book on this. And there is a reason for this. Females are going to have a better immune and metabolic systems, so they're not going to die from a stroke when they're at the childbearing age. They're not going to get as sick, but the cost of that, and that's so they can help take care of children. The problem is they have higher issues with depression and bipolar syndrome. Men, back in the day, didn't really help with any of this, and it was more important for them to not have these affective disorders. Said another way, you're not going to fight hard if you're depressed. So this was kind of the evolutionary, you know, background to it. The downside then is men are more uh, likely to have, you know, metabolic issues and immune system issues as well, okay? The other thing I wanted to mention before we go into the details here is that there is that thing called menopause. When that happens, you're going to have that permanent decrease in estrogen and progesterone. Usually it's around 54, which is where that 40 to 50 number comes in. And what's going to happen is females will start to behave more like males in their terms of their stress response. So they're going to start to have weight gain, start to have more metabolic syndromes, you know, heart issues. Do, is anyone's mom around this age? Yeah, no, maybe. Um, mine, when she went through menopause, one of the things that happened is she started snoring and that's because of starting to behave more and more in the stress response, like a male. That's why a lot of guys will start snoring in their thirties and women are going to probably start snoring post menopause. We'll talk all about airway next time. What you also see is that they're going to have that same increase in heart attacks because of these issues here. And it is still the number one cause of death in women is heart disease. Okay. Please. This is said another way. This is a uh, Jeff Rouse. He's an airway uh, faculty uh, down at Spear. I've followed his stuff for God, forever now. Um, young fit females become fat old dudes. 
That's pretty much what happens in menopause, and that's why we have to look at them in a different way. So once again, we know that with uh, females are going to have a higher uh, amount of depression, higher amount of, um, well, this is also depression, all the reds are females here. Same thing with anxiety, much higher female predilection. But you'll notice that it kind of drops down once the menopause hits. All right. Don't worry. This also applies when you have a baby inside you. <laughs> this all actually started in utero. So you can blame your mom for whatever issues you want if you want to. <laughs> Don't, please. I love my mom. We all love our moms. And what you see is men are going to be, if the mother is stressed, that stress gets passed on to the infant. And males are going to be at higher risk of neuropsychiatric disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. Females are going to be at higher risk for affective disorders, so depression and bipolar. So if your mom was stressed out, you have a higher risk, and that is based off of hormonally, whether you have more progesterone, estrogen, or more testosterone. Any questions so far? I know you never thought an endo lecture would have comments on this sort of thing. <laughs> so what then happens is that females are going to have a higher reactivity, which means that males are going to be more susceptible to bacterial and viral infections. I was actually thinking about this as I'm putting together some cases so we can discuss this. And there's a much higher amount of females who come in with like recent crowns where it's just cold sensitivity and really it's not that bad and it's a biting issue and i'm almost wondering if that's because women have the higher immune response so in them it respond it they present as like really cold sensitive biting pain whereas men because our immune system isn't as good the same tooth and a guy would just die and end up needing a root canal. So this is my, as I was on the plane f finalizing this, I, I kind of started thinking about that. I'll take a look and see if there's any literature on it. Probably not. Um, what this means, though, is that females are going to be prone to a lot of those autoimmune and inflammatory disease. So RA, Addison's, um, lupus, Hashimoto's. I was actually thinking back of all my patients. I don't think I've ever seen a male patient with RA or Hashimoto's. Uh, we don't really see too much of Addison's myasthenia. Lupus is pretty prevalent, but I do see a lot more females in there. Have you guys ever seen a male with RA? I, mean, I know they exist, but... My friend's little brother does. Yeah. Okay. So it's 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 just... It, you, you, but you know a lot more females who have it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of interesting. All right. Don't worry, this hits the guys as well with metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a any one of these five symptoms. Hypertension, hyperglycemia, excess uh, obesity around the waist, uh, low or high LDL, low HDL. And it's thought that about 80% of the United States population has some form of that. And so this is where we will kind of talk a little bit more next time about the impacts of sleep and things like that on it. But what you see, this is what I was talking about, the young fit females become fat old dudes. Men, this is starting at 55, are going to have most of their deaths from coronary heart disease, so something like um, heart attacks, whereas the second one is going to be stroke. Females, there's about a 10-year lag, and then all of a sudden they catch up to the men. That's what we were talking about, how those, you know, around menopause, all of a sudden, those metabolic symptoms start spiking that what the estrogen and progesterone were protecting them from. And you'll see the number one death in women actually is CVD. Part of this too, you'll notice that the other is kind of out. We'll talk about this. Women tend to have atypical responses or uh, symptoms. And so the medical establishment isn't as good at identifying it when they come in, which is one of the reasons they have a higher mortality, which is very sad. And uh, once again, we don't need to get into the state of our medical system today, but it's not great. <laughs> so when we look at men, what's going to happen is these symptoms, the metabolic symptoms are going to make them more prone at any point in their life to heart attacks, strokes, failure, things like that. Women, what we see is that in, let me move it over, perfect, in Premenopause, the estrogen is actually going to protect by lowering HDL or LDL, cholesterol, triglycerides, which are probably more important than anything else. And most importantly, helping with reendothelialization, which means that they, um, the you know, endothelial layer of your uh, arteries 
heals. That's usually where it starts is there's some damage to the wall of the artery and then plaques will attach to it and eventually it gets off and that's where you have heart attack, stroke and all that other fun things. What this means is that there's a protection for them against cardiovascular disease. Postmenopausally, though, we see that decrease, which then can influence your LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. If you have a history of preeclampsia or diabetes, you're going to be at higher risk as well. What's really interesting, though, here is that atypical symptoms lead to misdiagnosis. And so they end up having most females postmenopausally are going to have worse outcomes and more deaths because they don't really, you know, you're not looking as much because it's a much higher male predilection in the younger ages. And it's really kind of a sad state of the world. <laughs> okay. Now, as far as the um, w reason why men are going to have, if you have a lot of stress, instead of going down the anxiety depression route, you're going to probably eat a little bit more and have other issues like that. And your glucocorticoids are going to increase the amount of fat you have there, which increases the risk of all this stuff. So we know all this. And obesity is a really big problem in the United States. I've been tracking this map from the CDC since I was in residency, actually. This is my in my GPR. I did a little presentation on this. That was 2011. So they changed how they did all the methodology. So I don't I can show you the maps, but they don't make sense anymore compared to it. But here's where we were in 2011. Green is good. That's anywhere from 20 to 25% of the population has obesity. Uh, up here, you will at 45, 50. So you see West Coast looking pretty good. Northeast, not too bad. South has some work to do. You know, the rest of the country is pretty in that 25 to 30 range. By 2020, you can see it has not gotten better. Only Colorado, Hawaii, D.C., and uh, Massachusetts are kind of hanging out there. And as of last year, this is the most recent data. You can see only D.C. is still green. And we have a couple of states, Oklahoma, Louisiana, West Virginia, going into that 40 45%. So you are going to be seeing patients who are overweight and obese, and they respond differently than normal weight patients. And it's getting worse and worse. And, it, you know, Kind of look at your state, see where you want to go. Uh, California, Colorado, you're looking like, you know, only 25% of your population. So pretty good. If you're going to Louisiana, you're going to be seeing definitely heavier patients who have a different response to things. So in the question of is it nature versus nurture, genetics... What is probably more important than any specific genetic on the main chromosomes is, is it male versus female because of the impact of hormones? Well, the next question is going to be, well, sometimes we supplement hormones. What happens then? And there's actually some really good data on this. So for postmenopausal women who are being supplemented with estrogen and progesterone, what we actually see is that if they were, we already knew this, that the postmenopausal group is going to have higher metabolic syndrome. That's exactly what we talked about there. But what was interesting is that if they had a hysterectomy associated with this, they had a much, much higher rate of having metabolic syndrome. But even if you supplemented them with hormones after, it didn't, um, they still had, it, it, sorry, Postmenopausal hormone therapy was associated with a lower risk of metabolic syndrome in the women with natural menopause, but not those with surgical menopause. So kind of an interesting finding there. But you will see that hormone supplementation in women can help prevent metabolic syndrome. All right. What about men with testosterone? It's a big fatty. We don't it, there's there's studies showing each and every single different way. I mean, there, there's some saying yes, it makes it better some saying no, it doesn't. What really seems to make the difference is that when you supplement testosterone in men, they tend to lose weight. And when they drop the down from obese into overweight, you're going to see improvements in all of the metabolic symptoms. But is that because the testosterone, is it just because of the weight loss? Or is it also because of the impacts of testosterone? It's a little tough to say. I think we'll figure this out eventually, but a little tough to tell there. And then... Um, in patients going under for gender affirming care, one of the interesting things here, my wife actually works at the VA. This is a patient, this is a really good study um, among transgender veterans. And she was telling me if you are having gender affirming care, the hormone dose is much, much, much higher than it would be for supplementation in either um, cisgender patients who are either getting testosterone or estradiol after. So kind of interesting there. But what we saw is that, once again, no surprise, estradiol reduced 
your metabolic syndrome risk, testosterone increased it. The patients with the highest risk would be transmasculine. The lowest risk would be transfeminine. So once again, testosterone is going to have a higher risk of metabolic syndrome, whereas progesterone, estrogen is going to lower it. So this has been my presentation on all the differences between men and women. Thank you for coming. This is my TED Talk. We won't talk about it anymore, I promise. <laughs> Uh, does, everyone have, does everyone know the joke of this book? Do you guys know about this? It's blank on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. I, I, I know all of you are saying, okay, why, why did we go through all of this? What's the point of this? Well, I don't get lab values for my patients. I don't test their cortisol. There are ways you can do it with saliva testing, which is kind of interesting. I, I, don't, I don't do this testing. I have to do a root canal. They're not coming back most of the time. So, what is a way that we can look at a patient and use some of the data they give us to help figure out if they're going to be at a higher risk of having issues either during or post-operatively? And I have started using the medical history. I've been doing this now for probably about three or four years, and it really does make a difference. You can identify by going through the medical history which patients are going to have more of an issue. Now, a real quick talk on med history. Do you know what why I wouldn't do a root canal on a patient for med history reasons? What, what's your guys' reasons that you wouldn't do a root canal, that you need to go get, uh, you know, medical clearance? Don't all jump in at once. Um, Uncontrolled hypertension over 180-110. 180-110. Okay, cool. That's a good one. Anything else? A cancer bisphosphonate history. Okay. Oftentimes I've referred patients who have that because of that. So th there's been no incidents of, I don't even know what the term is today. I think it's like drug induced osteonecrosis of the jaws. So don't, yeah, I don't even know what they're calling it. Anyway, there's been all the studies that look at endo. There's no correlation with doing the root canal and having that. So oftentimes I will be referred patients specifically for that. So I'll answer, I'll take you guys out of your misery. Can they walk in on their own power? Is their blood pressure 180 over 110 or below? And have they had cocaine or methamphetamine in the last 24 hours? Because if so, the epinephrine could cause a heart attack. Those are the only real things that I wouldn't do a root canal on a patient. I've worked on, I mean, I'll tell a quick story of a patient I saw at my GPR in Minneapolis. He had a 12 centimeter ascending aortic aneurysm, which is bad. It's bad. Um, it was a 14-hour surgery. He was also a methamphetamine addict, and his teeth were absolutely destroyed. And so I got the call after the surgery to come in and take out all his teeth in the OR. We worked on him the day after he had open-heart surgery. <laughs> so that's a ex more extreme example. Um, it was under a very controlled environment. But the, for the pe people who go through every single thing on the med history, think of, use your big doctor brain. There's very few things that would prevent a patient from being able to need or be able to have a root canal and you can handle most of them. Okay. So let's go through. Remember males, we're looking mostly for metabolic diseases. Female is more psychiatric autoimmune. And then that metabolic syndrome, just a reminder of these four or five things. We are also looking in postmenopausal females for this. So I'm going to use the medical history that we have in TDO. This is what patients see when they go to fill it out. And in the first one where it's like the 11 questions, Really, these are the ones that I kind of look at. You know, have there been changes in your general health? Well, you know, sometimes people will be like, oh, no real changes, but I was hospitalized yesterday for a heart attack. Like, sometimes they don't think about it and telling the dentist that. So if they've filled that out, I'm taking a look. Are you under the care of a physician for a current problem, not just general care? And so if people are, you know, going to the doctor for, you know, their, like, cardiac... Okay, well, maybe I'm going to be a little bit more careful when I do X, Y, and Z as far as uh, treatment planning. You know, have you been hospitalized? Have you received therapy for alcoholism or drug addiction is a really good one because oftentimes patients who have chronic stress in their lives are going to abuse drugs and alcohol to cope with whatever that stress is, okay? Allergies are a big one. I've seen a very interesting correlation in patients who are allergic to latex, penicillin, gluten, the sunlight, 
and being more difficult to get numb, have post-operative pain, intraoperative issues, things like that. And I think it's because they're going to, if they're, you are allergic to those things, it's because your immune system is hyperactive. And so in a female, you're going to see more risk of the anxiety issues. Yes. Uh, anything in your health, anything in health. And this is the one that, do you wish to speak to the doctor privately about anything? This is the one, another one, it's a small little, like, if they check this, I've never actually had a patient say, can the assistant not be in the room? I don't know why we put this in there or why Gary put this in there when he made the system in the first place, but it's actually a really good marker. If they check this, they're probably a little more type A and have a little more anxiety and things like that. And I've actually found a correlation between patients who check this and patients who have those issues, you know, pre, during, and postoperatively. Now, when we go into the do you have or have you had any of the following, this is where we're going to split it out um, by the sexes and then look at the general for patients as well. In females, rheumatic fever is going to be inflammatory regulated. Allergy to latex, we already went over. That is a really big one. If they're allergic to latex, uh, they tend to be way more prone to having issues postoperatively. Oh, real quick, does everyone know the actual incidence of penicillin allergy? A true penicillin allergy. Do you know what the numbers are on that? This came out about two years ago. It's one in 20,000. So I've seen probably a little over 10,000 patients so far, roughly, maybe a little, maybe 12 since graduating. So based on the numbers, I should have just seen one patient with a penicillin allergy. How often do you think I see a penicillin allergy on the med history? All the time. All the time. Yeah. So I think a lot of people had it when they were kids, and there is a different response to penicillin when you're a child than you're an adult. So really interesting there. I think that's uh, something that we're going to find more and more as we look into it, that a lot of patients really aren't allergic to a lot of things they say they are. Thyroid problems, this is a big one. We'll talk when we go into ana local anesthetics about, you know, the patients who say I'm allergic to epi? What happens is they have a really strong response and their heart rate and stroke volume are both going to increase so they feel like their heart's jumping out of their chest. And usually it's patients with thyroid issues because in most women what they'll do is they either remove or use radiotherapy to drop out the uh, natural thyroid and then they take Synthroid. And Synthroid just cranks up their immune activity and make them far more likely to respond to um, epinephrine. So it's kind of interesting there. Psychiatric treatment, obviously, that's a pretty um, normal one. TMJ problems. Do you know how many times I see TMJ on the medical history? I feel like, like a lot. I a lot. Like a lot of people right? <laughs> so I work very closely with the TMJ specialist in town. And in the past five years since we've been working together, I think I've sent her four total cases for two true TMJ issues where there's arthritis breakdown. 99% of the time, what's happening is these patients are clenching like crazy, and that's where their TMJ symptoms are coming from. We'll go into this a lot in the next lecture. And then any problems with the immune system, that's pretty obvious as well. Okay. In males, we're going to go the opposite. We look at hypertension, heart disease, chest pain, anything that has to deal with cardiac is going to be where we're looking at for the men, okay? And then in both asthma, anytime you can't breathe properly, you're going to have a higher risk of issues with inflammation, alcohol abuse, mono. That's one of the, we talked a little bit about the um, sources of chronic inflammation and how sometimes it can be bacterial like tuberculosis. So mono would be an example of that. Uh, sinus trouble, anytime you can't breathe, there's issues. Diabetes is terrible for everything inside your body because the sugars just get sticky and attached to everything and your entire, you have issues everywhere. Um, anything with the stomach is going to cause, usually those are going to be inflammatory mediated. Hepatitis literally is, you know, inflammatory based. Same thing with kidney problems, cancer. You, you kind of get the idea here. So any of these that you see, this is a kind of a tool that you can use when looking at patients to figure out who's going to be more prone to having issues. All right. And then the last one I wanted to talk about on here is any herbal medications. And there is a ton 
of stuff out there. One of the issues is we don't know what's in it, but it's really expensive to get medical care in this country. And so patients are more going to be far more likely to just go to their local drugstore or go online and try to treat their own symptoms. How many people do you know who take melatonin for sleep, right? How many people know that melatonin causes severe issues with production of the sex hormones? Nobody. But we're out there kind of treating ourselves with all these things. So this is actually a really important one to look for. But what's difficult is there's a bunch of different things that you can actually take for anxiety. So magnesium can be for sleep, um, omega-3s, CBD. You got to be careful because oftentimes there's some THC mixed in with those as well. And I did want to quick talk about St. John's wort. Do you know why we always talk about St. John's wort? Do you know what it is, what it does? Anybody? It's a, for, uh, inhibitor? It's yeah. inhibitor. It's a what? <laughs> It regulates uh, CYP450. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how many go through CYP450? <laughs> so that's why we talk about it. But a lot of patients are on St. John's work because it does actually work. It is a mild antidepressant. So it really does help patients, but it also interacts with everything else that we give them. So that's why St. John's Ward is the most common one that we talk about. So have you guys ever used Examine? No, no. Um, so it's examine.com. Just write this down. Keep this in your back pocket. If you see a weird supplement going through it and you don't know what it's for, this is free and it will, um, it's actually really useful. I can, we can quick go on there. I have a little bit extra time here, but you can go in and let's say we want to do name a, name a supplement. Milk thistle. Milk thistle. Perfect. Okay, so when you go in here, it will actually tell you what it is, what they kind of, what do you use for it, a bunch of other names for it, and then there is, you know, you can sign up for their, you know, fancy pants one, but what's really interesting is it'll show, you know, what is the health outcome that you're looking at, and you can actually click on the study, and... It goes straight to PubMed or wherever it is. So you can actually look at the study yourself and see is, you know, w what is the actual data. So it's a really nice uh, website for you if you haven't, uh, if you don't know what the supplement is. I, I highly recommend it. I use it pretty often when I don't know what the heck the patient's taking. <laughs> Um, one other thing that we can look at that gives us an idea of chronic inflammation is actually in the radiograph. You can see PDL widening. It's a little bit easier to see on a cone beam. This is actually the surgery I did recently on that tooth right there. Um, but notice the widening here. That's not perio because it's just in this one area. What happened is she had a big old interference on five that was causing frematis moving back and forth. And so the PDL actually gets wider and you can see that in cone beams. You can't really see it on PAs at all. You can see signs of it when you look at like a bite wing that maybe the cusps are really high. But another way that we look at patients without you know having to, it's kind of one more sign that there could be something going on here. When we talk about the crowns, there are a bunch of different crowns. And as far as the, we'll kind of go into that next time. But this is one of my favorite quotes, which is from Frank Spear. You can use any occlusion you want as long as the muscles don't work. <laughs> think about the occlusion of a stainless steel crown. Do you think that it's in the proper occlusion when they smush that into the kiddo's mouth? No. The answer is no. Stainless steel crowns are terrible. But it's on a kid. And they heal and they don't clench all the time. Some of them do, but most of them don't, they have quiet muscles and it doesn't cause any issues at all. So what is the most important thing I'm going to teach you this entire two years or year? This, bull, the buckle of the upper, the lingual of the lower. Keep this dumb Texas Longhorn in your brain forever. This will be one of the best things you will learn from me, I promise. If you are having any issues, adjust those cuffs, and you'll be amazed at how much better the patients feel. So we remember this from um, occlusion. For class one occlusion, the buckles of the uppers and the lingual of the lowers, for most patients, 
they will find it far more comfortable if there is no contact throughout the entire excursive movement on both of these cusps. All right, let me repeat that. For most patients, canine guidance is the best option for them. And the way you put them into canine guidance is you take out all of the marks on the buckle of the upper and the lingual of the lowers on all the posterior teeth. It makes, it's the number of times we, I do this and patients are like, oh my God, that feels so much better. I haven't felt like this since before the crown was done. I hear this all the time. So keep this in your brain. The other thing that we can, the other way that we describe this is in implants. Everyone know the term implant occlusion? What's implant occlusion? Getting right down the long axis of the tooth. Right. Is there any lateral load on an implant, ideally? No. 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 Go, go ask Perio if they want. Go ask Perio how much they like doing uh, implants on canines. Probably one of the worst implant sites because implants aren't really designed to take those lateral forces, whereas in the posterior, up and down is the way to be. So on every root canal tooth, I try to put them into implant occlusion, and you'll be amazed how much of a difference that makes in the post-operative. Why is this still here? Go away. Go away. Um, if they are too high, it's going to cause lateral interferences. And does everyone know what the term frematis is? It's where you put your finger on the tooth, and when they bite down, the tooth physically moves. That's often a check that I'll do here as well. We are seeing it more and more because we're using harder and harder crown materials. So back in the day when we used gold and PFMs, it would be high for a couple of weeks, and you tell patients, oh, you're going to be sensitive for, you know, one to two weeks, during that time, the opposing would wear down the interferences and they'd be back to normal. The problem is Emacs and Zirconia are so damn hard, it's never going to wear down. The other thing is if you've ever watched how crowns are desi designed in CAD CAM software, they pretty much just try to get all four points of contact. And if you don't adjust it and just leave it in auto, you'll find these tend to be some of the worst crowns for this uh, sort of thing where the I've literally seen linguals that are like three millimeters higher than the buckle because the software tried to push it up so that it would contact on that side. So to summarize, there are some things in the environment. Genetics definitely play a role in stress. The most predictable one by far is male versus female. We can use this to help our patients. In males, you're going to look for metabolic diseases. Females, it's going to be either effective or inflammatory diseases. So for next time, we're going to do the airway part because I kept adding more and more to it, and finally it just became its own separate lecture. And we're going to go through cases that kind of talk about all of that. So just want to show uh, – one of the things my uh, – in dental school, we'd have these pop quizzes in the sim lab, and we all had screens. And halfway through the pop quiz, the teachers would always show the beautiful places they went on vacation. And so I've in inherited that as well. We were in Cancun last month. So this was Cancun, Mexico. We went for my uh, the oral surgeon I work with his, his uh, 40th birthday. It's a very fun time. So anyway, go ahead and stop screen sharing here. Perfect. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns, that sort of thing? Do you only find that adjusting the bowl is helpful when the patient has like a heavily restored like posterior occlusion? Like, do you ever find that to be something helpful if there's not as many like restorations and they're yeah. not necessarily virgin yeah. teeth, but just composites? Yep. Even, even on virgin teeth, because some people just have more anatomy. And so if it's sticking up a little bit higher and they have a completely smooth tooth opposing it, well, those high spots are going to be there. The other thing you'll see is that when people have wear, not every, there's not, remember the, it's a, what, crocodile versus a cow, or like the two occlusions that we learn. Some people go up and down. Some people go side to side. Most patients I see are clenchers. The teeth get together and they fire. That doesn't create flat spots. That creates if kind of like all these little high spots that stick up a little bit more. And you'll I often find that I have to adjust multiple teeth, often that aren't even restored because of where or because of how they were naturally. Good question. What else? So for the bull rule, would you only uh, adjust the one tooth you're working on or full quadrant? Oh, opposite. Uh, oh, good question. For sure, opposing. Do both both top and bottom. Um, 
the one yesterday was just uh, her whole bite was a complete mess. And she had, had like four crowns done. None of them actually fit in the right spot. And so her canine was just kind of hanging out in no man's land. So I ended up doing the entire left side. But what you'll see, there's this uh, A, adjust until they say that feels great. They're not going to come in and tell you, oh, I got an interference on the buckle cusp of number 14. They may not even say, my bite's fine. Adjust it until there's no marks on the bowl, and they say that feels great. The other thing you'll often hear, and I can't do it right now because my occlusion is a shit show. When all the teeth hit together at the same time, there's this really nice thwack sound that's made. And that's they'll when they do that, they'll almost jump up because it feels so nice to not have any interferences. And that's the sound you're hearing, is you're hearing everything hit together at the same time before they were doing this. And rattling around. So those are the two pieces of advice I'd give you is adjust until they tell you it's good. And if you can hear the sound, that's a that's a good sign as well. This is it sounds insane, but I think you I mean the first year or second year saw it. Alexa literally is like, I think I'm going insane. I have all these patients coming in with cold sensitivity that was at their general dentist. It takes two weeks for them to get in to see me, and they're back to normal what's going on it's this she's like half of what i do is bull teeth and i would agree half of what i do is adjust these teeth it's insane it's funny the last wednesday when i thought we were going to have the lecture my first two patients of the day were both this one male one female we'll go through those and then a couple other examples um just because i want to hammer this home <laughs> it, it's it's in when you get out it's insane how many people do not need root canals um, I, I had a post on my Instagram last December, and it was our year in the numbers. We saw, I think it was 1,250, 1,300 patients, and I only did 650 root canals. So literally half of the people who came to my office did not need treatment. It's pretty insane. So it's, it's a big problem out there. I think a lot of root canals are done needlessly because people don't know this. So. This is why I'm trying to teach you and everybody online watching this. So, any other questions? So, when are... you do that, are you are the general dentists that refer to you referring less and less of these, or like how do you tactfully tell them that this is something that they could do? I'll say I don't tell them it's something they could do because I charge a lot of money for my consults. Um, okay. I mean, I'm definitely I'm definitely the most expensive in town for consults, and it's because of this because I I. We might get into this if we ever talk about practice design. I'm an idiot, and I specialize in seeing anxious patients and kids, so that's awesome. Um, <laughs> I might do one retreat a day. I, I don't really do a lot of retreats. I usually see wide open, curious teeth and have to spend 30 minutes on the consultation to talk them down off the edge. And then the treatment itself is super fast um, because they're easy cases. So I am definitely... The filtering process is I see a lot more of those patients because I get those referrals. I never tell the dentist. I mean, if, if they're the other thing is the good general dentists tend to not send as many of these cases. They already manage it. They already understand this occlusion. So it's it's one of those. And the patients are less likely to be more stressed out. It's There's a lot of, it's multifactorial there. But I'll send you guys the language that I use for, I have a script that I use specifically for this. And we'll talk about kind of how to treat these patients next time as well. But there, there's a way you can do it. It's You never want to shame them on misdiagnosing. Um, and most of the time, the, the general dentist is happy the patient's out of pain. That's all they really want. Yeah. Good question, though. Any other questions, guys? I know you got oh, it. I think that'll do it. Do it. Cool. Thank all right. You. Well, you guys have my phone number if you need anything. Otherwise, I'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Bye, everybody. Bye.